Today we're going to hear about data science as the core, transforming business through AI and ML. I'm Rick Bushnell. I'm coming to you today from Philadelphia, close to our corporate offices, just outside of Princeton. Uh, just a little bit about Pronex. Pronex is well known for our expertise in application development, cloud IT, QA and testing, as well as DevOps. Uh, we design and implement data management and digital transformation programs. Also, we provide IT talent to augment your IT teams. Over 85% of our consultants are based here in the U.S. And Pronex has become a leader for talent in your time zone and in your location. Okay, let's get started. So I wanted to um, begin and have you all work here to explore the pivotal role of data science in business innovation. We wanted to equip you with actionable strategies for overcoming hurdles and share uh, some success frameworks for AI and ML applications. This session is designed for business leaders as well as anyone keen on leveraging data science for business transformation. So let's dive into the conversation with our distinguished panelists to uncover how AI and ML are reshaping the business landscape. Uh, let me introduce first Gokula Mishra uh, with his expertise from the Chicago land with industry experience in CPG and retail, just a, among a few, and Art Vansel, an expert in data architecture with a wealth of knowledge both from global consulting companies as well as leading data teams, and Joe Oquist, who has worked with industries like telecom, banking, automotive, and healthcare. Each brings a wealth of knowledge and experience in AI and ML as well as data science. So welcome and thank you for sharing your industry insights with us today. So let's get started a little bit with trends in data science. To set the stage, let's talk about evolution and foresight. Joe, what are the most significant trends you've observed in data science, AI and ML over the past year? And how do you foresee them shaping the future of business? Hey, Rick, well, thank you for the question. Um, you know, when we think about artificial intelligence, just to kind of level set, AI has been around for about 70 years now, um, since the Turing test in 1950. Okay. Um, yeah, but uh, what was surprising to even CIOs that had solid experience with AI was how fast ChatGPT was, was adopted. All of a sudden, these Gen AI capabilities are available to basically all of us. Um, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you know, I, I come from a family of, of artists. Uh, my, my grandfather uh, painted, uh, his son, my uncle paints, um, but it skipped a generation with me. I, I, I can't paint to save my life. I can't paint by number. Um, all of a sudden I've got Gen AI at my fingertips and I can create high quality art, photographs, pencil sketch, watercolors, charcoal sketch, um, and, you know, if I'm fair, probably my grandfather hadn't created maybe a hundred paintings over his entire lifetime. Mm -hmm. Um, over a less than a year, I've created literally thousands of images and I didn't, I didn't need a supercomputer. I, I honestly, I didn't even need a desktop. I did it right here with a little app on my phone. Um, so. You know, while your traditional artist might take might take them like hundreds of hours, if not days, to create a beautiful piece of art, um, you could literally create these in seconds. Um, so that's the power of gener generative AI. Um, and we're, we're honestly just getting started. You know, when I started with this, I, if I look back at the at the images I created a year ago, you know, I thought they were so cool back then. Today, I, it's, it's garbage. You know, if you look at you know, where it's come from mid journey, you know, version two or three to mid journey six, mid journey six, you really can't tell the difference between is this a real photo or is it not? It, it's gotten that good, which, you know, raises a lot of different types of concerns um, with deep fakes and whatnot, what we've seen in the news recently. Sure. Um, yeah, but you know, the good news is that OpenAI is coming out with a watermark so that we can now identify what's real and what's, what's AI. So hopefully that'll get adopted um, across um, all the different platforms. Um, 
You know, it's what's interesting is the time frame that we're in. Right now, the G7 nations have been, been experiencing a, um, a, a, a declining productivity growth. And it's been this way, honestly, since about 2005. Mm -hmm. So Gen AI comes on the scene right at the proper time where all these corporations are looking at how can we increase our productivity? So Gen AI um, is the solution. So how big is the opportunity? Well, according to McKinsey, AI has the potential to create between 2.6 and 4.4 trillion dollars annually uh, in global, global corporate profits. Um, that's the good news. Good. The bad news is, <laughs> there's, there's the good and the bad. The bad news is Goldman Sachs estimates that uh, upwards of 300 million jobs, uh, full-time jobs, could be replaced by Gen AI applications. But there's a silver lining. There's also good news there too, because we're gonna create, according to Harvard, Harvard Business Review, we're gonna create hundreds of new categories of jobs. And, uh, and at the same time, overall global productivity is gonna be bolstered by, uh, by around 7% annually over a 10 year time period, according to HBR. Um, so, you know, before we talk about trends, I, I think it's just helpful to kind of level set where, where we came from to where we are today. You know, our forefathers started as hunter gatherers. The problem at that time was that food was scarce. Now, you could be a very skilled hunter, you know, you have great tools, but someone stronger than you is going to come along, hit you over the head, conk you over the head and take your food. That was a problem. So problem. how did we solve? Yeah, that's a pretty big problem. So we solved for that by gathering together in tribes. Tribes would war with each other. But when the tribes settled along riverbanks, we started to produce agriculture. Then food became stable then the tribes started to trade with each other. Now, if we fast forward to the first industrial revolution, we shifted from agriculture to mechanized production. The, with Industry 2.0, we saw the widespread use of electricity and mass, mass production. Industry 3.0 brought automation and digitization. And of course, with Industry 4.0, we've got um, smart factories, uh, internet of things, and most importantly, big data. Um, so what type of potential does Gen AI uh, hold? Um, well, according, you know, we're, we're just producing mind boggling amounts of data right now. And according to Statista, we are pre creating as a society upwards of 120 zettabytes of data. That was last year, for, for last year. And to put that in perspective, that's 24,000 times the amount of data produced from the beginning of human history through 2003. So data is the key equation to AI and ML algorithms. AI and ML without the data, you can't do anything. So data has become the new fuel. And so when I think about where we're headed in terms of trends, I like to think of three things, uh, data-centric AI, the adoption of cloud and edge computing and data literacy and democratization. And data-centric AI is focusing, focusing on the quality of data that are used in the AI models. Rather than solely on the algorithms themselves, you wanna make sure that you're using high quality data to ensure that the results are accurate as well as useful. Cloud and edge computing is key because now you need faster and more efficient processing because of these large volumes of data. And finally, data literacy and democratization have become increasingly important because businesses are recognizing the value of making data-driven decisions at all levels of the organization. So those are the three trends that I think are key and that we'll see uh, that are ongoing right now and that we'll continue to see uh, this year. Wow, great. Well, that's a fantastic foundation. Uh, for the conversation, I'm, I'm thinking about um, going maybe into the transformations that are capable through AI and ML. Um, you know, innovation through technology drives transformation. So, Gokula, I'm, I'm wondering, could you share specific examples where AI and ML have reshaped or significantly improved a business model or operation? Uh, sure. <clears throat> 
when we talk about business transformation, I just want to be clear um, is that business transformation happens not just because of AI, but because the opportunity for that you know, business transformation um, existed, either it was seen or not seen by the business itself, but the, the fundamentally, it is the new way of doing business. That's, that's what business transformation is. And because AI provides some of the brand new capabilities that we never had before, and, and doing it at scale and speed uh, that uh, is providing ideas for uh, business transformation that uh, uh, is being enabled in many different industries. And, and for one to actually achieve that transformation, one must think from ground zero with an AI first mindset to leverage AIML to do business transformation. So one of the example would be um, in the insurance industry, uh, when you know you have flood, for example, or any natural disaster, um, the customers of an insurance company will file claims. And, and uh, one of the biggest challenges that the insurance companies uh, used to have, uh, and some, some still have, is how do they figure out, A, that what the claim is, that it is actually right and it's not a fraud, uh, or, or they're asking for a lot more than what uh, uh, happened. Uh, B, what is the right amount of compensation that they should give the customer and, and, and keep the customer satisfaction at a high level and the loyalty of the customer at a high level? So AIML specifically has helped in uh, figuring out the damage that the natural disaster might have caused and, and uh, really using the vision technology and a few other estimation technology very quickly, they can figure out the, the, and assess the damage and be able to compensate their customers in the right way, as well as mm -hmm. remove uh, and eliminate fraud uh, through that clean process. This is a totally new way of doing business. Sure, so that's a great example. Uh, Art, just kind of pivoting over to you, have you seen uh, some good examples where AI or ML have improved business models or operations? Yes, I've seen several, uh, but as an advocate for AI and ML in your company, you probably want to have a quick win. You probably want to see a sure. solution that comes up reliably and that gives a lot of business value. So I would start with the simpler applications that have lower risk and don't require as much company-specific data or context. And some of these are keystroke automation, where you can automate the mechanics of typing the data, or workflow automation, where you can hand off tasks faster uh, by using the AI and ML engines. These would provide a, a faster time to value, faster than problems like customer relationship management, where you have business rules that are specific for a customer or specific to your company and the AI doesn't know your business rules. Or product innovation, where you're looking to capture markets with new products and new features and the AI doesn't really understand your sweet spot or the business uh, advantages of your company. So I think uh, to gain quick, uh, quick traction in the space, we need to look for simpler problems and show grow on our success. Yeah, it's a great, great point. Well, let's talk a little bit more about uh, implementation strategies. So starting the journey is often the biggest step. Joe, I was wondering, can you share a strategy for successful implementing AI and ML in business, especially for beginners? Yeah, uh, happy to do it, Rick. So when I think about this, you know, I, I always like to use an analogy of, let's say you're you're gonna go, you wanna go scale a mountain, right? You've never done it before. Um, now you could try to do it without any training, without any skills, without any special gear. If you do that, you're probably not gonna get far up the mountain. If you wanna summit the mountain, you wanna make sure that you're physically able, that you've got the proper gear, and that you maybe even go alongside someone that has experience doing this. I think the same type of analogy can be applied to a successful AI ML rollout, right? Um, with AI and ML, 
first thing, you want to make sure you do the data housekeeping. You want to make sure that the data is cleansed. You want to make sure that the data is categorized. You want to make sure that your departments are not siloed, that the data isn't siloed in this department and that department. But, but at the same time, you need to have a vision of where you're going. With a mountain, pretty easy, right? You want to summit, you want to get to the top. What is your goal? What is the vision? What are you trying to achieve? And to Art's point, maybe start with some small wins. You know, mm -hmm. if you start with some small wins, that's good uh, mojo for your teams. You know, that gets, let, let them have some quick, quick wins, some quick successes. And that gets the teams motivated. But here's the point. Let's say you don't have the skills in-house. Then you might want to come along some consultants that help you get it stood up, right? Mm -hmm. But don't be idle while the consultants are helping you stand this thing up. While they're helping you stand this up, make sure that you either skill your workforce, right? Or hire some people that are gonna be able to take it over because consultants are expensive. You know, um, you can't keep them around forever. Or, you know, you're not gonna, it's not cost effective. Um, so definitely invest in training. And then finally, my last thought on this is you need to foster new work habits. You need to think data-driven culture right? Where can the data help us, right? Because AI and ML, they work well alongside of humans because humans have the ingenuity to say, this is where we need to go. And then you can code the AI and ML to help support that vision and those goals. Great. Um, so we did start a little bit late. Uh, I think we'll go to a quarter past the hour and Put your questions in through LinkedIn. We'll take a look at them. I'm gonna leave us about five minutes at the end. Take a look at come on questions and if there's some patterns in them, and I'll put them back to you all. Um, so thinking a little bit about the direct impact of AI and ML on business, um, you know, transformations, real world applications tell the success story. Art, I was wondering, can you provide some specific examples where AI and ML applications have fundamentally altered business operations or strategies? In, in the last 10 years, there have been some tremendous company transformations. Not only companies, but industries. Entire industries have stepped on new technologies and changed the way that they're doing business. One of those technologies is photo images. Uh, as Joe mentioned, um, there's a lot of artwork and image work that can be done automatically with AI. And in industries like railroads, um, the images have been used to detect encroachments on the railroad trucks. Uh, they use visual pattern matching where the cameras are mounted on in the front of the train. They take photos of the track ahead. They identify hazards. And some of those hazards could be fast moving hazards or stationary hazards. And so all of this uh, determines the response that should be um, given to the encroachment on the railroad tracks. The same type of technology was used in automobiles for um, visual pattern matching or self-driving vehicles or driver assist. So driver assist has come out into the automotive industry in all of our cars now because the AI can detect images. It knows where you are. It can see the lanes that you're driving in. It can see the vehicles. It knows a pedestrian. And how does it know that? It knows it because it's an AI pattern matching on the images. And the same thing for power companies. Um, power companies have to have right-of-ways for their uh, electrical lines, and they can't have encroachment by vegetation. And so images from for the right-of-ways, uh, sometimes captured by drones, are able to um, identify high-risk areas for uh, right-of-way infringements. All of these are technologies that weren't available just a few years ago, and that now are changing the way these industries operate. They're able to give higher value to their customers and respond faster to emergency events. Uh, we could look at transportation. We could look at transportation companies. They're optimizing routing and logistics using <coughs> machine learning. Uh, specific algorithms help to optimize where trucks go and uh, how fast the vehicles have to travel. Mm -hmm. uh, mining and equipment Trump and uh, equipment companies are predicting equipment failures based on machine readings. So some machines are able to detect um, inaccuracies in their operation 
and some machine learning algorithms are able to detect when these inaccuracies mean that the machine is about to fail. And there's a big cost a difference between a machine failure when it breaks down or a pre preventive maintenance activity when you take it down for a repair before it fails in a manufacturing process. Um, then there are warehouse distributors who have forecasting um, demand. Uh, when, you, when you've got logistics and you have to keep inventory in the warehouse and you have to have the right goods on the shelf, there are machine learning algorithms to uh, identify demand patterns, forecast what's coming up in the future, keep the right shelf stock. All of these things are important. And although humans could do the work and they have for many years, <laughs> the AI and machine learning applications do them much faster and give much faster results. Well, that's a great wealth of examples for sure. Um, Joe, just from your experience, any additional examples where you've really seen kind of business operations um, be fundamentally impacted or change strategies for kind of different industries or, or projects you've worked around? Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, Art gave a lot of great examples. Um, PayPal is using AI and ML to detect and prevent fraudulent act, um, transactions. Walmart is using AI and ML to optimize supply chain operations. Um, Maersk, uh, the shipping container, yeah. uh, is using AI and ML to optimize its shipping routes. Um, Netflix uses AI and ML <clears throat> to uh, to provide personalized recommendations. So we get to, you know, we're, we're seeing what we expect to see. Um, Rolls-Royce right. uses AI and ML to predict potential engine failure in their, uh, you know, the, the aircraft engines that they produce. So yeah, I mean, art art nailed it, and there's just a, there's a lot more examples, but there's just a few more. Excellent. Well, overcoming challenges is kind of one of the things uh, that everybody faces as you get into projects like this. So challenges are but steps on the ladder to success. Art, I was wondering, uh, what are some common challenges in integrating AI and ML, and how? Have you seen them effectively addressed so far? I have to go back to Joe's answer on um, relevant data and high quality data. That's the biggest challenge, uh, is to find data that will drive the appropriate results. You can get results from bad data or missing data, but it won't be results that will help your business. So some of the data problems that you'll encounter are missing data or gaps in the data. Uh, gaps would affect trending. So if you have machines that are shut off six hours a day, then your your trends are going to have a six hour uh, gap uh, in their uh, calculations and they'll, they'll be wrong by 40 or 50%. So you have to consider the fact uh, that you have either intentional or unintentional data that's missing in your algorithms. Another uh, problem with data is non-authoritative data. You went out looking for data, you found data, and you put it in the algorithm, but it wasn't authoritative. It doesn't tell the real story of what's going on in the business. So you have to make sure that the data you use for your algorithms are appropriate for the problem that's being solved. And then sometimes in IoT, you get machines um, submitting data electronically, uh, automatically, and, sure. and those machine results are often noisy. Um, a lot of jittery uh, results come in uh, constantly, and those types of data collections uh, hide uh, data spikes or anomalies in your data. And so you have to use uh, algorithms like the fast Fourier transforms to get rid of the noisy uh, data patterns and to find data that gives you meaningful trends uh, so that your algorithms can operate on them effectively. And then there's out of range data. Sometimes you have data that comes in a zero when there should have been a value. It comes in extremely high, outside of the range of normal, but for example, um, 30 hours in a day uh, would be an example of something that's unreasonable. Um, you have to have a facility and a plan to detect these data anomalies, these data gaps, this non-authoritative data, and deal with it. And this takes effort, and it takes time, and it takes analysis work and it takes challenging the status quo. And so these are labor intensive and uh, high value uh, data science work to compare the data that you're receiving 
to the results that you're trying to obtain and confirm that they're relevant. A couple of yeah. other challenges I'll, I'll mention very quickly. Uh, I know yeah. we're running short on time, but there are, there, there are different types of problems in data science. So tightly focused problems where we're looking for a specific outcome and machine learning algorithms are very well adapted to giving uh, data a, uh, an algorithm uh, output that solves a very focused problem. And then there are wide open problems that you might ask ChatGPT about. And the uh, chat may give you uh, answers that are widely, uh, yeah, widely correct, but may not be correct for your company. So you have to consider uh, the type of problem that you're asking in the AI and ML and whether you will benefit from a tightly focused approach like an, a machine learning algorithm or a op wide open, creative, innovative answer that might come from AI. So the challenge is adapting the right tool to solve the right expectation for your business. That's great. Uh, and I like the a lot of specifics in there too, which is useful. Um, which kind of brings me to thinking about future proofing. You know, staying ahead means planning ahead. Kokola, I was curious, how can businesses future proof their AI and ML applications? Um, they really need to pay attention to the architecture uh, and the design process that uh, is used for developing AI ML applications. Um, uh, because this uh, the space is changing so rapidly uh, and new techniques uh, are coming rapidly. For example, uh, when we started with uh, LLMs, um, you know, the, most of the applications were kind of single dimensional and, and as companies started using them, uh, it became an issue to integrate with other systems and, and then uh, we uh, figured out, uh, you know, a RAG is, is a good model uh, for us to actually integrate across various uh, AI models as, as well as various uh, data applications. And, and so this space is going to be evolving, but if you pay attention to the architecture itself and keep it flexible, and, and I would say the, the right phrase to use would be, you know, loosely coupled, uh, then you will have the ability to uh, adapt to new technologies that will be coming uh, in the future. The second thing, which is nothing to do with the technology uh, that I would reflect on that is also needed for getting the most value out of the IML applications today and in the future is really focusing on uh, making uh, people and process AI centric and driving the cultural change that is needed driving the change management that would be uh, needed when you are in, uh, transforming the business using AI, paying attention to those uh, will help you kind of build a AI culture, AI adoption culture, AI trust culture in the company, and that would be needed for uh, future-proofing the AI ML application adoption. Very good. So maybe just kind of building on that a little bit, <clears throat> success stories, you know, success stories inspire action. Can you share a transformative kind of impact story of AI or ML in an organization? So there are, there are lots of uh, use cases that uh, I can uh, talk about. A few of those, for example, uh, healthcare. Uh, there is a tremendous amount of work uh, going on in healthcare. One that you might have uh, read in the press, uh, AI ML is uh, actually transforming the detection of breast cancer. Uh, and uh, it, you know, it is finding um, you know, cases where it might have been missed by humans because it is able to uh, be trained on a much richer set of uh, data and therefore be able to identify uh, breast cancer cases early on. Uh, the second uh, use case that uh, in healthcare uh, companies are using, which uh, you, you know you can say revenue optimization, meaning uh, they are they are using AI to spot where uh, they are billing uh, um, unnecessarily to a patient, which is actually uh, 
a, a big source of frustration for patients and, and also sure. hospitals trying to um, rectify it. But also they are finding cases where uh, they should have built for certain things, but they, are, they have not. And, and so it's it's a win-win situation uh, in, in, in the meantime. I talked about some of the warranty fraud prediction. Uh, right. This is an area that a lot of companies are doubling down using AI so that uh, they are not losing money to, to fraud. Very good. Uh, Joe, just want to come back to you too and see um, success stories. Anything come to mind? So uh, there's an interesting one that came out recently. The University of Minnesota uh, utilized AI and satellite imagery to detect soybean aphids in the field. So they're using this to make sure that they don't overuse the pesticides in agriculture. And so there's a there's now a, a smart use of pesticides in agriculture based on this uh, University of Minnesota study. I thought that was a, a, a pretty interesting one. It's pretty recent. Um, so that's one that comes to mind. Yeah, very good. Um, so just kind of thinking that it's a good one, and I, I wonder, you know, how do you measure success? What, what gets measured gets managed. Uh, so back to you, Joe, just how should companies measure the success of their AI ML initiatives? Yeah, uh, great question. So. Um, Basically, we've touched upon this already a couple of times. You know, what is the vision? What is the goal? The measurement should be based on that vision or goal. Are you trying to increase revenue? Are you trying to reduce costs? Are you trying to increase uh, efficiencies and productivity? So, you know, um, accuracy is one thing that should be measured. That's one key uh, KPI when, when dealing with uh, AI models, you know, it compares predictions to actual outcomes to make sure that it's performing properly. Um, mm -hmm. But then again, you know, if your initiative is to reduce costs in your organization, <laughs> is it re actually reducing costs? Is it performing to expectation? Um, right. Is the expense that you've incurred worthwhile based on the cost reduction? Maybe it's, you know, longer term. That's something that uh, you could look into. Um, revenue engagement um, and revenue growth, um, increasing sales by using predictive models. Um, you know, a certain audience segment is more propense to buy this offer than that other offer. Showing the customer what they expect using AI and personalization. Um, these things, um, and then of course, you know, measuring measuring it. You know, if you don't measure it, you don't know that you're successful. Um, customer satisfaction. You know, in increasing your NPS. Um, that mm -hmm. could be a goal as well. You know, so um, implement and then test, you know, and assess, is it, is it, does it have the efficacy based on the goal that we have chosen? Or is it performing to the expectations? Very good. And Gokula, just from your experience, um, measuring the success of AI and ML initiatives, what are your thoughts or kind of what have you driven towards in the past? I think I think we need to. Uh, um, so right now there is so much hype uh, around, specifically around Gen AI, that sure. uh, how do you measure success <laughs> is is, uh, is is kind of a, a an issue. Uh, uh, but I think I think for any of the AI project, you should always um, early on measure the impact and risk or rather assess the impact and risk and continuously monitor that because at some point uh, you really do need to innovate uh, at scale and speed. Right. But at the same time, you cannot lose sight of the risk that it might be causing that you may not know uh, early on and then maybe realizing it as the, the project uh, progresses. Uh, second thing uh, would be, you know, how prepared you are uh, in the change management and culture perspective. Because to me, the success of what you are implementing is, is also measured on, are you uh, ready for uh, implementing that in your company? Are people going to adopt that? Uh, so some, some uh, form of making sure that the change management readiness 
uh, is there is is also a measure of success. Obviously, the business value realization uh, is is the of course the the main uh, key metrics that you need to look at. But make sure you look at both the short term um, impact of what you're trying to do as well as the longer term, so that you're not uh, you know missing out. Uh, on uh, uh, as we talked about, you know, there are there are smaller things that you can start with, uh, which will deliver the short term, uh, but also then you can grow that uh, to more of a long term business benefit. So tracking uh, the business uh, benefits uh, and keeping an eye for the long term uh, is what I would say uh, measuring success of uh, AIML. Very good, appreciate it. So. Um... We're getting to, to the end of the session. So if you have questions, feel free to put the questions in and we'll take a look at them and, and share them out to the panelists. Uh, while you do that, I was just thinking kind of final thoughts, advice for IT leaders. You know, leadership is about making strategic decisions. So Art, I was wondering what final piece of advice would you give to IT leaders about integrating data science into their core business strategy? Sure. Um, well, what I've observed is that CIOs don't get fired for technology problems. They get fired because they don't understand business expectations. <laughs> they don't meet business expectations. So the first thing, first advice would be to manage business expectations. Help the business to understand the technology. Help the business to know what's feasible, what's not feasible. You're going to be challenged to repeat what company XYZ did. They did it. It's in the it's in the news. Um, what you may not know is that they spent 10 years on a data cleansing and data quality project that led right. up to the right, the right fuel that Joe mentioned for these uh, AI and machine learning computations. So don't get caught in a trap of uh, trying to play catch up to companies who have a head start on you. Take a business problem that's reasonable for your business. Uh, take a, test the, the use case to make sure that the technology is appropriate for the use case. And then go forward with a moderate expectation and do it well with high quality uh, for, with predictable and repeatable results. Uh, the second thing is um, having to do with external AI engines. Uh, Deloitte had a survey recently where they found that more than 70% of companies are using external vendors for the AI engine. And to me, what that means is that the external engine is making the business decisions. And I have to ask myself, what does that engine know about my business? There, There's a real gap between what's known in the public and what's known inside my company four walls. And sure. there may be a lot of data that I don't want to give up to a public engine. Uh, we've seen a lot of uh, data privacy and uh, security issues with search engines. So mm -hmm. uh, there will be even more opportunity and temptations to send your company private data out to a third party AI engine to make um, uh, confidential company decisions. And I, I must encourage people to um, observe that. And so uh, the, the final point is get your data security officer uh, involved in AI before you start sending your business data to external parties. Great point. Um, <clears throat> just kind of to each of you too, Joe, just final advice to IT leaders. Yeah, you know, uh, if I think about, let's say you're an IT leader, you're so excited and you want to talk to your to to your team about this AI initiative. Just beware that there might be some resistance. There might be a little bit of fear. They might think that they're going to lose their job, so they might want to not support it. So I think that you you need to be careful about how you communicate AI initiatives and organizations so that people understand, hey, look, you know, we're going to train you guys to take on new responsibilities. This doesn't mean that you're going to all be replaced. So there may be resistance. If you don't, you, you need to be very, very clear on uh, you, 
you know, careful with your wording about AI initiatives within organizations. Um, secondly, you know, you need to foster a data-driven culture within your organization. It's a different way of thinking about things. You know, um, how can the data help us support our goals? You know, that may not be the way that all organizations think today. Maybe some of them already do. And if they do, that's great. But um, it needs to be a data-centric organization, which may theoretically be a mind sh mindset shift or a paradigm shift within certain organizations. Um, and, you know, um, I think this was already mentioned, but uh, make sure that your AI and ML um, uh, systems are ready to adapt and quickly pivot. Um, you, you don't necessarily need to use a, a massive lar large language model in your organization. It might be extremely costly. Um, and when OpenAI makes any little tinker with its code, guess what? All those downstream APIs are going to break. So, um, you know, you might want to go with a short, a smaller player like Mistral out of France, um, which is just as successful as some of the bigger players. Um, so those just some thoughts from me. I appreciate it. Uh, Gokula, we are getting kind of to the end. I just wanted to give you an opportunity. Uh, yeah. Any other recommendations or thoughts for IT leaders? Yeah, I've, I've talked to um, you know, a number of IT leaders, and I think one of the things that they're struggling with is, uh, you know, do I go full speed or do I wait and see? Um, and my my advice for IT leaders would be, um, you know, don't go full speed that you ignore the risks. Uh, so you have to uh, actually not wait <laughs> for for others to uh, try and then only start. This is a technology that's moving really fast and you're going to miss out uh, if you're going to wait and see. So um, I, I would say really go and, 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 and you know with the, with the right speed, with a calculated uh, kind of risk assessment along the way so that uh, you're not uh, um, you know fearful of uh, what you're doing. Uh, the second aspect would be um, go seek out help because uh, this technology has moved so fast that finding people uh, to hire or staff or having trained your, your own people to have the right skills, um, you may not have that situation. That might be uh, actually a problem for you. So it is okay for you to go and get help from outside. There are a lot of good companies that uh, are uh, going to guide you uh, in the right direction. That's great. Yeah, and I apologize. We are kind of running out of time and we didn't get to the questions. There were a couple of good ones that were, and you started to touch on it, but I think uh, acquiring talent was, was in, in retaining them was a key one. Is It's a very hot space right now. Uh, so finding good talent and retaining them is a, is a bit of a challenge. But um, look, we'll hopefully feel free to reach out to uh, anybody that was part of the panel. LinkedIn is great and these webinars are great because you can kind of find any of us if you have further questions or feel free to reach out to Parnas to sure who put this together on our behalf. So as we wrap up uh, today's discussion, I'd like to extend a heartfelt thank you to our panelists, Gokula, Joe, and Art for their invaluable contributions. Your expertise and insights have shed light on the transformative power of AI and ML in business. 